My name is Chief Zachary Smith. I'm the EMS Director for South County EMS. And South County EMS, or SOCHEMS, is the regional ambulance service for Southern Franklin County in Massachusetts. And we cover the towns of Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley. So individual towns had their own EMS service before South County EMS that relied on a volunteer pool of responders um, at the basic or intermediate level, which are two lower levels of uh, ambulance service that, that is below paramedic level. There's multiple levels of emergency medical technicians, the highest being paramedic. And really what that represents, a EMT basic, it's a one semester course, it's typically about 120 hours, and that's just basic kind of life-saving bandaging and maybe providing somebody with some supplemental oxygen. Paramedics, you're looking more at three, three and a half years of school. And what those paramedics bring to a patient is everything an emergency department would be able to bring to that patient. So whether it's the medications they give, the assessments they can do, um, and the interventions such as intubating them and providing uh, therapeutic electricity to restart their heart, those are all things paramedics can do uh, that the other levels can't do. We were dispatched uh, for a chest pain call. Um, and the first arriving crew made contact with the patient. And they determined uh, that she was incredibly anxious. Uh, there was definitely a medical issue happening. Uh, but that crew was not at the paramedic level. And they weren't able to use the diagnostic tools uh, that a paramedic level service uh, has available to them. Uh, I arrived on the scene a few moments later to intercept our own agency, uh, which is I was not on duty, but I came to, to meet the ambulance and elevate the level to a paramedic level service. Uh, I was able to do a 12 lead EKG uh, in the patient's driveway, determining that they were suffering a massive heart attack. Uh, I was able then to make the decision to transport to Bay State Medical Center because that's the facility that can help this patient. Um, had we not been a paramedic level ambulance at that time, the patient would have gone to Franklin Medical Center, and they don't have the capability of making a difference for that patient. Uh, as we were going to the hospital, we had done our interventions. We had started multiple IVs. We had given the patient fluids and medications uh, per the protocol. Uh, but the patient's myocardial infarction, her heart attack, spread, and uh, her heart went into a fatal rhythm, and she went unresponsive. Uh, we initiated CPR, and I was able to deliver a, a shock to her heart, which restarted it immediately. The patient became conscious as we were going to the hospital, and she didn't know what happened, um, but literally her life was saved uh, in that moment. Uh, she got the, the care that she needed. She was on her way to the place that she needed. She went into surgery uh, within the hour uh, at Bay State, uh, got the care that she needed there, and was able to return home. Uh, her heart has a couple of stents in it, uh, but it's working as it should. Her brain is intact. Uh, she has no neurological deficit. Uh, she didn't stop breathing for any length of time that caused any damage. And she's back home leading a normal life. And I think that's the difference. The best part about the regionalization that we've accomplished here at South County is that uh, prior to our regionalization, each town, Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley, had a lower level of ambulance service, those, that basic level. And, and they were volunteer services, and when we talked about response times and how important response time is, those lower level services, people actually had to drive to the station, pick up the ambulance, and then drive to the scene. And if they needed paramedics, then they would have to call them from Northampton or Greenfield. So in total, it was taking sometimes upwards of 20 minutes to receive that care. Uh, now that we're regionalized, we can combine our resources, pool our resources, and together we can actually provide a paramedic level service that responds immediately. And what once took 20 minutes to get a paramedic to a side through combining our resources, we now get paramedics to people's sides on average right around seven minutes. Now South County EMS has all the resources. Uh, I'm able to work at the top of my profession. I'm able to uh, work on those skills that just benefit the, the community. One of the nice things about having a community-based service is that uh, when we get out to the community, we can do a lot of things. So we can provide services such as community outreach through CPR classes and first aid classes, and we can bolster our community up. So if somebody were to have a medical emergency, they can receive care almost immediately from the people around them. The other thing that we can do when we go out to the senior center and the schools, elementary, middle, and high school, is that we introduce people to the EMS system. Um, and that has two very big benefits for us. Uh, one kind of long-term is that 
these people are exposed to it as a career and they learn about emergency medical services, paramedics, EMT basics, and maybe options that they can explore when they're, when they're choosing jobs and careers in the future. Uh, one of the maybe more important uh, things that comes from that outreach is that now those people, those children especially, are comfortable calling 911. They've already met us once, they've already seen the equipment once in a non-emergency situation, and then if they're ever in a situation where they need to call 911, they know the people already who are going to respond. And they're not strangers, they're familiar faces. And we've, we've actually encountered that a couple times in South County. Community paramedicine is a new concept to uh, the paramedic world. Uh, it's been tried, the concept has been tried in a number of locations, uh, mostly in other countries at this time. Uh, and it's defined differently uh, depending on the service, but it's tailor fit to the community uh, to meet the community's needs. The goals of community paramedicine are to avoid uh, injury, disability uh, of patients before they need emergency services. Uh, so what in general that means is a paramedic uh, who is somebody that's already trained and working in the community that's notably uh, used for responding to emergencies can take a more proactive uh, stance and go into patients' homes and assess, uh, for, for instance, uh, blood pressure, uh, maybe fall risk, uh, if they have some items that uh, potentially might make them trip or become injured. Uh, those can be rectified before there's a problem. Uh, for general public health, uh, dispensing of uh, flu shots or vaccines, uh, or especially on a large scale in a large emergency, are things that community paramedicine can do. Uh, for us, it would be essentially defining uh, a role that's very similar if you uh, hearken back to the days of you know doctors making house calls. They were community members that were trained and they could visit you in your home in your situation and uh, make uh, decisions based on your environment and uh, improve your condition within your home. That would be the role of the community paramedic. Certainly uh, additional training would be required uh, because we are reactive as a service for, for paramedics. Uh, but that is that is the goal of South County EMS. We have talked about community paramedicine. Uh, that's something that we are investigating. Um, at this point we are identifying our community's needs and in the future that's definitely something that we'll be investigating to serve the community that much more. It's absolutely wonderful having our local responders being the people that uh, operate on South County EMS. When we would call mutual aid or those intercepts from Greenfield and Northampton, they were dedicated professionals, but you're right, they weren't from the community. And now that we're a, a regional full-time service, those are all the same responders that people are familiar with. They know the community, they know their neighbors, and they know the areas in order to respond or get around what bridges are out and things like that. And, and to have somebody show up at your door who you recognize from this corner store or something like that can definitely help a lot and make a huge impact. So I think what really speaks to the mind of the investment of South County EMS members, uh, very recently uh, we were dispatched to a call. Um, Paramedic Timothy Drumgool, uh, who lives in Northampton, was on his way into work that day uh, when he recognized the address of a, a patient that he had recently taken care of. Uh, he responded on his own time uh, to that patient's house uh, just because he already had a rapport with that patient. He, he knew about their medical conditions uh, and he wanted to you know, show his support to them. Uh, when he arrived on scene, the patient recognized him as, as the person who took care of him last time. And I think uh, the patient and uh, his family relayed that that was extremely meaningful. And they, they pulled us aside after the fact to reiterate that fact, um, that that's not, certainly nothing that they ever expected. They never expected uh, somebody to take the time you know, to listen, uh, to recognize uh, what their address was, to come out of their way to serve them and just because they knew who they were. And uh, that would be you know, one of the investments that South County has made. We get to know the people that we serve. They come to know us too, and we do care about them. I would say the best part about being in EMS is knowing that at the end of the day, I've made a really tangible difference in somebody's life. Uh, everything's kind of immediate. And so people call you when they have a problem and it's beyond their ability in, in all of emergency services. That, that problem is beyond their ability to kind of manage themselves. So just to bring a little extra support, whether it's through equipment, whether it's through training or just kind of a moral support that we're going to get through an emergency. And then at the end of the day, going home and saying, you know what, 
we made a difference for at least one person that day. Uh, the best part about the job is maybe the cliche part about the job. I like to help people, and I like to help people uh, at essentially when the unimaginable happens to them, the worst day of their lives, I can hopefully do something for them, and that's the most rewarding part. I've been in this business since I was 16. Um, I got my first responder. It's a kind of a glorified first aid when I was 16. And then I be got an EMT basic certification right when I turned 18. And I've been in emergency medical services ever since. We never wish ill on any of the people that we serve or for bad things to happen to them. But we pride ourselves on the fact that we've trained for the worst case scenario. We've trained to help them uh, in their time of need. And we're very happy to be able to do that. The anatomy of an emergency medical call really starts when somebody picks up the phone and they dial 911 and that gets answered by an emergency dispatcher up in Shelburne Falls and they're employed by the state police and they ask what's the nature of the emergency and where the emergency is. Once they learn that there's a medical emergency and it's in one of the towns that we cover, they actually dispatch us via radio and we are alerted to where the call is and what the nature of the call. Our crew gets up from their office, they walk out to the ambulance, they start the ambulance up and they drive to the call. And once they arrive on scene, well I should say on their way to the call, they start brainstorming about what type of equipment they're going to need, what they might encounter based on the information the dispatcher relayed to them, and formulating a plan about any extra equipment, what they need to carry into the house or extra uh, personnel or resources. Our ambulance is staffed with one paramedic generally and one provider of a different certification level, which does make a paramedic ambulance. We receive the tone just as in uh, the times before South County EMS, but the difference is that that staffed crew can move to the ambulance and uh, take it directly to that particular scene, um, which we have an out of shoot time, which means the time that we receive the call to the time the truck is on the road moving towards the call is about one to two minutes. Once, they, once the EMS crew gets into the house, they interview the patient and any family members or bystanders that are there, and they do a full, thorough patient assessment. And the goal for that patient assessment is to find out what is that person complaining of, why do they call 911, um, and what symptoms they have, and then what signs they have. And the difference is a symptom is what a patient complains of, and a sign is what a paramedic or an EMT actually sees. So things like sweating and changes in color. They put all that stuff together, all their education and training and all that time that they've spent in school coalesces at that moment. And they take what they observe and what they hear and they formulate what they believe to be what is wrong with the patient and they can start their interventions. And that might be as simple as a splint or a wrap or something to support a joint or it might be something very complicated like delivering electricity or a medication in somebody's vein or starting that IV. Uh, all the paramedic equipment that we need will be brought to the side of the patient. We can do all the diagnostics, we can do all the uh, IV access at the patient's side, extricate them and then make an informed decision about what hospital to go to from that point. Once that treatment has started, now it comes down to actually what we say extricating the patient from their house or from the car. And that can be as simple as somebody just walking outside as they normally would, or it might be more complicated. We have backboards where somebody lays down and we actually physically carry them out of the house. We also have special chairs that they can sit down on and we can wheel them downstairs and things like that. A lot of our job is actually trying to uh, figure out how we're gonna move a patient from where we find them to our ambulance. Once we get them in the ambulance and they're on the stretcher, they're seat belted in just like everybody else should be seat belted in a moving vehicle, and we continue that treatment. So if there's any more treatments we need to give, or if we assess them and their condition changes, then we might change what treatments we give. We continue to do that all the way to the hospital. As we're going to the hospital, we call the hospital on the radio and we tell them what type of patient we have, what we've done for them and how they've changed, and then the hospital gets ready for our arrival. Once we get to the hospital with the patient, we wheel them in and we actually give report to either the nurse or the doctor. So the same way that a nurse gives report to a doctor and a doctor gives report to another doctor, we give report as well. So we tell them the name of the patient, we introduce them, we tell them what's going on with them, the, the uh, interventions, the medications and things that we've given that patient, and then we hand off that patient care. And then once everything's done, 
all of our staff, all of our EMTs and paramedics are required to write a patient care report. And that's a medical record of everything that we've done and we've learned about them. And that gets entered into their actual uh, medical record as part of that, that whole package. This is our cardiac monitor. This kind of is uh, this. This is our cardiac monitor. This is what allows us to really diagnose um, or take a look at what a patient's heart is doing, and then make very important treatment decisions based off of this. And this is something that a lot of time is spent uh, analyzing and understanding in paramedic school. So we get to look at what a patient's heart is doing electrically, and then this monitor also allows us to do a lot of other things that we can monitor the patient, like um, how much oxygen is in their blood, uh, something we call end tidal CO2, so how much CO2, carbon dioxide, they're actually blowing out of their lungs, and that tells us physiologically how somebody's doing. Um, they also do blood pressures for us, and does a, a, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so we can actually, we'll, uh, we'll start off by kind of hooking me up and we can see how these things go. We'll go from uh, basic to complex. So this is like a, uh, this is just your standard blood pressure cuff um, that you would uh, have at the doctor's office. And this machine, uh, we can actually set, it'll take a blood pressure for us and we can set it to take blood pressures at regular intervals, whatever we want. So this allows us to monitor a patient's blood pressure kind of in real time while they're on the ambulance. and. Uh, get a sense of how their vital signs are changing as we're treating them. So, do you want to help me here? There you go. Yeah, thank you very much. So we'll do that and I'll just start taking a blood pressure while I keep talking. Uh, the other thing that we have is, this is called capnography and there's a little light in here. It's actually an infrared light and when you put this on a patient's finger, what this does is it measures how much oxygen is in their blood. Um, that's kind of a really simple way of saying it, but it lets us know if somebody's complaining of breathing problems or they might have smoke inhalation or something like that. This gives us the clue about how much oxygen uh, is actually in their blood and this, now that these numbers are popping up, uh, down here my blood pressure is being taken 137 over 92 is my current blood pressure. It's a little high right now because I'm on camera. Up here, uh, 97, that's a percentage. That's my oxygen saturation. So it's telling me as a percentage how much oxygen I have on my little hemoglobins and it's 97%. So that's pretty good. It means I'm breathing good, I'm moving air and I've got good gas exchange down in my lungs. And then up here, uh, it's kind of bouncing around a little bit, but that's 79, that's beats per minute. Uh, now it's going up. And that's how fast my heart is beating. Again, it's a little out of a, elevated because I'm on camera. So this is kind of the, the basic stuff that we uh, look at a patient with. Once we start getting into cardiac monitoring, if anybody's ever been to the doctor and they've had an EKG or a stress test or something like that, they'll be familiar with these electrodes. Um, and they're just like that. They're an electrode and what they do is they measure the electricity that's flowing through your heart. So we can actually, we can actually stick some electrodes on me and we'll see what my heart is doing. A lot of things in our bodies, we, we have a lot of proteins and a lot of chemicals in our body, but uh, all of our muscles, all of our muscles and all of our nerves and things like that are controlled through electricity. Very, very small amounts of electricity and this actually picks it up. And this is designed to pick up what's going through our heart. So once I get, I'm gonna have to put some on my legs here, excuse me for a moment. All right, I'll stop moving around here. And here we'll see on the screen, see those little blips? That's actually the electrical activity that's happening in my heart right now. And as a paramedic, we can see those blips and we can interpret them and we can know exactly electrically how healthy someone's heart is. When somebody has um, a fast heart rate, we see that because there's more blips. 
Or if somebody's having a heart attack, we'll actually attach more electrodes to somebody's chest and we'll take what's uh, called different views of the heart. So we can actually tell if somebody's having a heart attack and then we can tell exactly the spot on that heart where that heart attack is occurring. And based on those things, we actually give different medications uh, depending on what we find. And those are things, that's something that paramedics are trained to do that EMT basics aren't and something that South County can do now that we're a paramedic service that the previous services couldn't do. Uh, and then, if we want to get really fancy, this, and you'll notice it gets a little, uh, gets a little jumpy there. That's because I'm moving around. Just like I said, everything has to do with electricity. What we're seeing, those little wiggles, it's also kind of picking up the electrical impulses in my muscles. So that's why that's doing that. But we'll put this on me next. And just like this thing on my finger measures the oxygen attached to my blood, this is gonna measure this is gonna measure how much CO2 I'm blowing out of my lungs. And this goes in here. And this will show up on the bottom here. And it'll show up as a little graph in a second. And you'll notice as I'm breathing, that's called a waveform. And it's measuring millimeters of mercury how much CO2 I'm blowing off. And a normal amount is between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. That sounds complicated, it kind of is, and that's something that paramedics learned in school. But you'll see right here, that yellow number, 37, 38, um, and that means I'm right in that golden spot of between 35 and 45. This tells us a lot about what somebody's doing physiologically. If somebody has uh, COPD, uh, emphysema, asthma, all those things, we can actually find out how somebody's doing. We can even find out if somebody is in cardiac arrest, how long they've been in cardiac arrest, and we can start to anticipate when we're going to be able to resuscitate them based on all of these numbers and uh, how they change over time. So this is kind of all of our assessment stuff, all on one person right here, working together. and. What this machine also allows us to do is not only assess a patient, but also treat them. So I'm going to take this off real fast, just so I don't hyperventilate trying to show off there. Once we assess a patient with this machine and we look at their heart rate, if we see a certain type of heart condition, and this is something that paramedics are trained to interpret, if we see a certain heart condition, sometimes the indication for that treatment is to actually shock their heart. So just like an AED, an automatic external defibrillator that people learn about when you do CPR, this does something similar, but it's completely manual. There's nothing automatic about that. And that's because paramedics are trained to treat... Oh. I'll turn that off for you. It thinks I stopped breathing. I was going to say it's a flat line. That's right. <laughs> so just like an automatic external defibrillator that you learn about when you learn CPR, this is a manual defibrillator. And that means that a paramedic is trained to do everything themselves, interpret the rhythm, and just figure out how much electricity and when to deliver it. And that's because we can actually give electricity in different amounts based on different rhythms that an AED can't actually do on its own. So. Once we use the machine to figure out what's wrong with the patient, if there's something wrong with the patient, um, we can actually turn to this side of the machine over here and all these, these bright yellow and orange buttons, and that's actually how we can deliver a shock, uh, just like an AED would, but the paramedic makes a decision about when he or she wants to shock and treat a patient. So this is our, in, in this truck, our paramedic gear, um, and it's divided up in 
kind of different categories and everything on an ambulance we set up so we can grab it quickly or we can bring it into a house so like I said we can start treatment right at a patient's side when we first find them so instead of having to get all the way to the emergency room on your own and waiting to see my nurse and go to a room and have the doctor come in we can do it all wherever you're sitting whether it's at your kitchen table or whatever and that we do that by putting things in bags so this is our one of our primary medication ALS bags and we'll take a look at that in a second. Up here is actually a safe that we put our narco narcotics in and each paramedic on the service is issued their own unique uh, pin code and they have access and only they have access to the narcotics and that's all logged and dated and at the beginning and end of every shift our, our paramedics sign out and sign in those narcotics uh, since those are considered a controlled drug. Over here we also have IV stuff. We have IV warmers. So when you get an IV and you get some fluid, uh, it can cool you down pretty fast if it's room temperature. We're at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit normally. So this warmer will actually warm that fluid up so we don't cool you down when we give you those fluids. And then back here we have some more intubation supplies. So if somebody's not breathing, we can actually breathe for them. So all those are in bags and we can take them out as we decide we need them. So this is our primary paramedic ALS bag that we would carry into a house or carry with us. And this gives us a lot of the, the tools or toys that we sometimes refer to them as, as a paramedic. Uh, everything is compartmentalized. Every ambulance service might have a different style bag, but basically we've all found that this works the best to have things in bags. So right off the bat, we'll just open the main compartment here. And what we can see is that kind of the emergency things here. So these are all different drugs that we use if somebody's in cardiac arrest, typically. Um, and we put them right up top here and so we can get to them quickly. We have a sharps container because we use needles and we want to stay safe. And then we have our fluids and some more, um, some more drugs down there. Over here, uh, we have IV kit um, to start IVs on people. And this is actually, if we can't get an IV on somebody and we absolutely have to give them medication, we actually have, it's a drill. It's a drill and we actually can drill right into somebody's bone and we can give medication that way. It's, uh, it's very fast and I'm told it hurts less than an IV, but I don't know. I've never had one myself. We also have things in here for um, airway. Uh, this is a nebulizer treatment. If anybody, uh, either themselves or knows somebody who suffers from asthma, this will be very familiar to them. We can give albuterol updrafts and uh, breathing treatments like that. And that's something that we uh, commonly do. Um, so I mentioned that these are all uh, drugs for our cardiac arrest. We actually have a lot more drugs available to us. And uh, in our service, we carry them on an outside pack here. And each one of these drugs does something different. And as a paramedic, we're all required to memorize what each of these drugs do and be familiar with how much we need to give in what order, what drugs can go together, what drugs shouldn't go together, and uh, what drugs hurt patients in certain conditions and what drugs make patients better. Uh, every one of these uh, has a different use. We have things uh, like um, Haldol. We have things like some of you will recognize some of these, diltiazem, that's if somebody's uh, also known as cardizem. If anybody suffers from uh, AFib, they might take that uh, in pill form. Uh, in an emergency, we can actually give it to somebody through an IV. We have things, uh, metoprolol, which is low pressure. Uh, people might be familiar with that. What else? Ah, here's, here's one that's been in the news a lot recently. It's naloxone or Narcan. And this is something that we can give to patients who are suffering either from a heroin overdose or otherwise having an opioid overdose. And often in the news we're talking about those kits that they hand out. You can give it nasally. We can spray it up into somebody's nose. We can do that, but as paramedics, since we can start IVs, we find that giving medications through an IV work a lot faster and a lot more reliably. So we'll give that Narcan through an IV 
uh, instead of going through the nose. Um, we have things like uh, buterol for the breathing treatments. We have nitroglycerin, which uh, sounds crazy, but we use that for somebody who's having chest pain. We have uh, lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, we even have stuff simply for uh, nausea. As a paramedic, these are all things that uh, a paramedic is required to memorize and know off the top of their head. That when you're a paramedic, you're alone in the back, typically with a patient, so you need to know these things in your head. You can't take the time to refer to a colleague as you could in an emergency department or go to a reference material. It's really, you're the front line, you gotta do something. So we really hound in paramedic school that paramedics feel comfortable with these drugs. They're familiar with their dosaging and what patients can receive them and what patients can't. Uh, we also have simple things like glucometers for checking patients' blood sugar. Uh, we need to do that before we give them certain stuff. Uh, glucose, we even have EpiPens. And people who have um, allergies to things might recognize that. So just as you would carry an EpiPen around in your purse or book bag or pocket, we have them too. So when somebody's in anaphylaxis shock, we can give them an EpiPen. So as I said before, we carry everything in bags. We kind of compartmentalize it. This is our airway bag. So if somebody is complaining of a problem with breathing in general, um, or they might not be breathing because of another condition, this is the bag that we go to. Um, it actually is set up like a backpack since it's a little bit heavy. So we, our providers can carry it wherever they're going. Say somebody's on a hike in the woods, we can put our bags right on our back and bring them in that way. Uh, our main compartment, everything is kind of designed to fold out. We have um, devices for breathing for people. We have an oxygen tank for providing the oxygen. And we can do things like provide CPAP. Um, this is something that if somebody has ever su uh, suffered from uh, COPD or something like that, where they have a very hard time breathing because their lungs are filling with fluid, um, this is a device that we can strap to somebody's head and actually push that fluid back out of their lungs. Um, this saves a lot of lives, and it's a really, really great tool to have. Uh, one of the interesting things is if we have a patient who is not breathing at all, like in a cardiac arrest, we want to be able to give them breaths. So we can intubate them is our, our main option here. And here is our laryngoscope setup. And this is a device that we use to actually open somebody's mouth and look down their windpipe, look down their trachea. And they're called blades, but they're actually not sharp at all. Um, they're just pieces of metal, and they're actually disposable, and they have a little light on the end. And when, when you attach them to a handle, the light comes on, and we can actually put this down somebody's mouth and lift open their jaw, and we can insert a tube right into their windpipe. And through that is how we breathe, them, breathe for them. And what that allows is for us to deliver oxygen without it going into their stomach or things like that. It only goes into their lungs. And if anybody's unfortunately ever had to perform CPR, they'll know that one of the most difficult things is that breathing portion. Uh, and a lot of CPR classes now, they don't even teach the breathing because it is so difficult. So paramedics uh, spend a lot of time training and uh, practicing to breathe for patients, and that's the equipment that we use to breathe for them.